Thank you very much. Um, so my name is James Carlisle, and I work for a company called R3CV. Uh, and I'm going to talk uh, tonight a little bit for about 10 minutes on how R3 is uh, building a bridge to implementing distributed ledgers in banking. Uh, and I'd like to say, first of all, thank you very much to Andy and to Eddie for uh, having me here. It's great to talk. So um, R3 is a consortium. It's a consortium of banks. And um, a year ago, there was no R3. And the founder of R3, uh, a man called David Rutter, was on a road trip uh, visiting banks, trying to understand their concerns trying to help them understand what the opportunities were with uh, blockchain technology and distributed ledgers uh, in banking. And one of his first observations, which is a key one, is that uh, banks find it very hard to collaborate with each other. Uh, with uh, scandals such as LIBOR, there's a raft of uh, rules and regulations around uh, collusion and anti-competitive behavior. And uh, as a result, banks find it hard to, to talk to each other, for example, at conferences. Um, and what he did with R3 was set up a consortium which is a safe umbrella where banks can collaborate. And of course, for distributed ledgers, um, it only really makes sense, in, in my view at least, to, to use those across enterprises or between enterprises. And so collaboration is uh, really, really important. So um, the first banks joined R3 in the summer uh, about nine months ago or eight months ago, and by November there were 42. And um, 42 really of the world's largest banks, um, really the sort of A-list of banks that one could hope to, to sign up for a consortium. Um, and the banks themselves, some have been at uh, distributed ledger and blockchain technology running experiments in-house for a couple of years. Uh, others are much newer to it. Um, but they all share a desire to um, to work with each other, to understand the technology, to collaborate, uh, and to experiment together. I think they all realize, they've run individual experiments, they realize now that individual experiments within their enterprise don't teach them a lot. Because obviously in production it's going to be about working with other banks. So R3 has three main focus areas at this point. Uh, the first is a focus on architecture and technology. And um, I'm going to cover these in a little bit more detail in the following slides. Uh, the second is a focus on research and experimentation and proving stuff in reality. And the third is uh, product development, looking at uh, financial products, looking at the use cases where distributed ledgers might be useful and looking at the business cases that are needed to implement them. So taking these in turn, um, the, the first area, the technology area, is looking at uh, particular utilities that it, we feel are going to be necessary to make distributed ledgers useful in banking. Um, we see repeating themes, uh, for example, themes like cash, um, and cash in its different forms, whether central bank cash or, or bank-issued cash, uh, identity, asset modeling, and so on. Uh, another massive area for banks is, is reference data. Uh, and in fact, we, we really should include identity within reference data. But uh, reference data can consume inordinate amounts of uh, bank investment. Um, and there are technical considerations that are coming out as well. So some of the key ones here, things like interoperability, <laughs> That's interoperability across uh, different uh, distributed ledger platforms and also with existing uh, schemes and frameworks like Swift. Um, uh, there's a strong focus on non-functional requirements. Uh, and, and the non-functional requirements of banks are quite different from the non-functional requirements that led to the creation of some of the early uh, distributed ledger and smart contract platforms like Ethereum. Um, and we're also strongly interested in uh, the, the legal foundation for these smart contracts, what it means in real-world law, how do we tie smart contracts back uh, into a judicial framework. Um, the other thing that R3 is doing is uh, it's prototyping its own platform. Um, so a lot of the banks have done a lot of work with platforms like Ethereum, 
uh, and they are great, and they're b maturing quite quickly. But um, we think there are a number of non-functional requirements around privacy and scalability that the existing uh, open blockchain and, and distributed ledger platforms don't really address. It, it wasn't part of their sort of initial requirement set. Um, so we are experimenting with prototype code, and we're taking a completely different approach. Uh, but the main difference, the approach we're taking, is that although we want a shared ledger, that doesn't necessarily mean that all of the data gets shipped to everyone. That's the key difference. Uh, and that gives us a help with privacy and with scalability issues. Uh, and we're also really interested in, as I said, how we tie uh, smart contract code to legal pros. So uh, this is a really simple representation of um, a core concept in our, in our platform. Um, and it's the concept of a state. And the state is the representation of an agreement between parties. So there's three key points to note here. One is um, that the state is signed by parties that are party to it, digitally signed, in a non-repudiable way. Um, the second is that the state is bound to uh, code. And the platform determines whether the code uh, is valid for that state. And it ensures that the state is governed and controlled by the code. In other words, the way in which the state can be changed is controlled by code. The code is a representation of a contract between parties, in a sense. And the third thing is that there is a legal prose reference. Um, and I mentioned before, we, we are very interested in ensuring that the smart contract uh, automated and self-execution can be tied back to a real-world judicial framework as well. Um, we've done some work with uh, one of our member banks, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that afterwards, about, um, about how we link, for example, ISDA agreements to uh, smart contract execution. OK, moving on. Um, the second area for our three is an experimentation area, lab. Um, and what we want to do is take uh, business ideas, business processes, hypotheses from um, that product team as well as the architecture team and the technical team and, and test them out in real life in the lab. Um, and we are moving uh, towards a project-based approach where we're driven by the interests of the member banks. Our first experiments in February involved uh, all 42 banks running smart contracts simultaneously. It was really exciting. Uh, time boxed, but we realized that uh, actually banks have different interests from each other. They have regional interests and they have different focus areas, for example, identity or cash uh, or, or derivatives or other products. And so um, they, they're at the moment spearheading projects and um, they, they lead the projects. The banks are involved, they second people in, uh, experts from, from within the, uh, themselves. Um, to get involved and, and run these experiments. Then, of course, the experiments are published across the consortium. Um, and the third area, I mentioned uh, product or, or uh, financial product and, and business use case. So the points to note here, I think, um, the banks between them have this enormous uh, range of interests. I mean, there are something like 40 different financial products that were initially listed that they wanted to investigate. Uh, and we focused initially on commercial paper, interest rate swaps, and trade finance. But there are many more. And um, we're starting to explore some of those other ones as we move forwards. Um, the other point really to, to see on this slide is that we uh, believe strongly that the regulators and standards bodies need to be involved. So we, uh, as, as an organization, we have lots and lots of conversations with regulators in uh, North America and in Europe. Um, and we know that the existing regulations around um, KYC, Know Your Custom, Customer, and AML, uh, and so on, and the other compliance regulations need to be enforced uh, even when we move to a blockchain world. And, and the aim for us is to make sure that banks understand the regulations that apply and will still apply, but also to make sure that the regulations are as, as simple as they can be. We want to make uh, complying with regulations easier and cheaper. And uh, we're very interested in having 
regulators participate in the networks so that, for example, regulatory reporting can become much easier. So to sum up, um, R3 is a startup. It's, it's very young. It doesn't act quite like a startup, although we're, we're unencumbered with bureaucracy. We also face off with an industry that itself is highly regulated. Uh, we're driven entirely by our members and their interests. Um, we're, we're project focused so that the member banks can direct uh, the projects that they find useful. Um, we're building a platform, but we're in a sense also agnostic to platform choice. You know, we want to inform platform providers of what the banks need, their requirements, and also be able to inform the banks about uh, the platform technologies. So if you have any questions, um, I'm going to be around afterwards. I'm happy to take them then or now. Hello, you, you mentioned Swift. Um, and are you, do you see a world where your technology will integrate with Swift or replace Swift or, or what? How does that work? Because that seems to be the heart of, that's how banks transact with each other at the moment. Right, thank you for the question. So I see a world where uh, absolutely um, distributed ledgers will need to integrate with existing uh, frameworks and processes uh, and networks like Swift. And uh, one of the things we're looking at in particular is, for example, how we move assets onto a distributed ledger. Um, for example, originating with, a, a, if, if you like, a real world payment. How we move assets off the distributed ledger back into the real world. For example, by instructing a, a Swift MT101 or 103 or something. Um, so absolutely, interoperability with those existing um, networks is, is going to be key. Yeah. No, I agree completely. Thank you.